coordinated approach. We're going to get started in just a minute. Um, while we wait, we want to give everyone a chance to log on. So um, we will get started in one second. All right, I think we're going to get started. Um, thank you again to everyone that joined us today. Uh, we know your time is valuable, so we really appreciate you hopping on the Marketing Planning Like a Pro webinar brought to you by AND Marketing. A little housekeeping before we get started. All of the participants are muted so everyone can hear the presentation clearly. Uh, we will be taking questions throughout the webinar using the questions box, so please feel free to submit your questions as they come to you. Um, we will also be using Ann Marketing's workbook during our presentation today. So we're going to put a link in the chat box so that everyone can access it during the presentation. And you can work along um, throughout the workbook as we're talking, fill it out, um, and ask questions along the way. So with that, let's get started. Uh, I am Amanda Cook, and I am the Marketing Director at Ann Marketing. I have spent my entire career in marketing roles that um, have run the gamut from marketing coordinator at small firms to marketing director for nonprofits to North American marketing director for a billion dollar manufacturing company. So I have a lot of experience in strategic planning and developing some of these integrated coordinating marketing approaches to help achieve business goals, um, which we will talk through a little bit more today. I'll be your host today, but the real meat and the real conversation is coming from my two colleagues, Raj Kapoor and Tracy Kola. Raj is the founder and managing director of AND Marketing. He brings nearly two decades of professional experience in marketing, sales, strategic development, spanning B2B, B2C, Fortune 50, mid-size, and small companies. He is a highly sought after facilitator and experienced marketing lecturer with experience across five continents. Tracy Cola is a marketing director for Ian Marketing as well. She is a well-rounded marketer with experience with companies like John Juice and Pete's Coffee. She has a talent for identifying opportunities, uh, product strategy and positioning, go-to-market strategies and launches. Um, we are gonna get started, but I just wanted to remind everyone to feel free to ask questions at any time using the questions box. And we'll get those answered throughout the presentation and at the end. With that, I'm going to turn the reins over to Raj to kick us off. Thank you so much, Amanda. Appreciate the warm introduction. And I'm really looking forward to sharing some um, tips and tricks as we uh, operate with a whole range of different companies here at Ann Marketing. Um, so, Amanda, can you uh, flip the page to the first fundamental? So the way that we're going to go through this webinar today is really through four fundamentals. And again, uh, if you go to our website or through the link that we put in the chat box, um, you can download this workbook. It's for your own use and you're welcome to use it. What we like to do is have, um, have this be as interactive as possible. Uh, we have a, a bunch of participants on the line. So if you put any questions or comments that you have in the chat box, uh, Amanda is going uh, to interrupt and ask questions as we go. And then the reason that it's a, a PDF is we want you guys to use it immediately, put your information in there and make this immediately applicable to your business. So the way that we'll go through the, uh, the four fundamentals is I'll take the first and the last one and then Tracy's gonna come in with the middle two. And the first one we always like to do is start with strategy. So we call that developing your marketing framework. And so when we start by developing our marketing framework, we really wanna start at the business level. So what we mean by the business level is where is your business going? What is your long-term aspiration or your long-term success vision? 
generally speaking, this success vision can be uh, extremely specific, like you want to hit a certain, I don't know, dollar revenue by a certain amount of time, you have a certain employee count you're trying to get to, or you have a certain number of customers you're trying to get to, that's really acceptable. Uh, a lot of times we deal with uh, growing companies that don't, that maybe don't have a specific long-term success vision, but it's more general. They want to be thought of as a thought leader in a particular area or in a particular geography, or they want to do something that's a little bit softer. And that's absolutely okay. But the most important thing to a marketing strategy is that, the, is that it really clearly aligns to what the business wants to do. Depending on what the business wants to do, we can build a plan that helps execute on that vision. So maybe I'll give people a moment to fill in what their long-term success vision is. Again, it can be something like a revenue number, it could be an employee count, or it could be something like a um, presence that you wish to acquire in your particular industry or particular geography, whatever your business holds. Then we like to go through strategy. And there's really four parts to strategy. And uh, obviously we've oversimplified this for the webinar format and for the workbook format. But uh, we really like to have a fundamental grounding in strategy. So the first question we like to ask, as it says, is who are your target audiences? So the target audience is who is your customer or your ideal customer? And we encourage you to get as specific as possible about who this person is. So for example, if you're a if you're a business-to-business -business type of a business, don't say something like business owners, because that's extremely general. Your target audience can't be all business owners. Is it of a certain size, a certain industry, a certain decision maker within that company? On the consumer side, don't say something very general like moms with kids. That's a very common, broad customer target or consumer target that we hear from our consumer clients. We encourage you to be much more specific. So is it moms with kids of a certain age or who do certain activities or maybe who have a certain condition or who are, you know, some some sort of mental um, uh, makeup where they have a predisposition to wanting something else. They want to eat very healthy, or they're too busy. Get as specific as you possibly can when you're talking about your target audiences. The second strategic question we would like to ask is, what are your audience's biggest challenges? What are the biggest challenges that they face on a day-to-day -day basis? I like to ask this as a, what do you think about in the shower type of a question? Or what keeps you up at night type of a question? What are these people's biggest challenges? Is it that they don't have enough options? Is it that they are looking for efficiency? Uh, the moms with kids example, maybe they don't have enough healthy food alternatives. In a business to business setting, that might be that they're too busy and they don't have, uh, they don't have any uh, grasp on what their technology option should be. There's a lot of these types of things and I encourage you guys just to focus on maybe one or two of their biggest challenges that they face. And I'll give you folks a moment or two to really think about what those biggest challenges are. Number three is what is what makes you unique? as the solution to these challenges. So if you think about it in the first two strategic questions, those aren't about you as a business at all. They're really about the decision maker who you wanna provide a product or service to in exchange for your, for, for, for your services or to charge them, right? So the, the, the next one is what makes you the unique solution to those challenges? And there's a couple of ways I, I encourage you to think about that. The first is, how do you solve those problems? And that's you know a great way to think about it. Again, in a consumer example, if the audience's biggest challenge is that they don't have enough healthy food options, maybe you provide healthy food options for them. I'd like you to think a little bit deeper than that. What makes you unique or different? Is it in a particular place? Is it in a particular food category? On the business to business side, the unique solution to those challenges, are you the best? Are you the fastest? Are you the best to work with? Are you the least expensive? Quite often, irrespective of your business, decision makers are faced with a myriad of challenges. And it's really difficult for, to, for, to have them uh, determine what the best solution is for them because there's so many options. 
So having our clients think about what's unique about them really helps drive clarity of messaging. We like to say we're uniqueness obsessed because finding that element of uniqueness is sometimes the hardest part. Again, in this webinar format, we don't have the time to go through each of your businesses, but happy to go through any questions that you may have. Okay, and then the fourth tact, the fourth question under strategy is, what are the tactics that you either use today or you want to use to attract these audiences' attention? Okay, so what are the marketing tactics? And there's a myriad of tactics out there. What I encourage you to think about are what are the ones that you use successfully today? Or maybe what are the ones you haven't considered yet that you're interested in learning more about? And I'm happy to answer questions around that. So specifically, think of it from your target audience's perspective, not from your perspective. It may be the easiest for you to send out messages on LinkedIn or Facebook or social media or emails or something like that. But if that's not the way that your target audience receives information, it's probably not a good idea. So really consider from their perspective, what are the places they go? If you have downloaded the book that we just sent out uh, on the chat box, what I encourage you guys to do is go to page number seven. That is the demystifying digital jargon. So as you're thinking about targets and where they go to, to uh, get information, you might glance through some of the ideas that are in that jargon sheet. What we did in that page is we tried to put in plain English what those, uh, what each of those pieces of uh, marketing jargon are really about in plain English. So there might be some information there, but it also might spark an idea about the different avenues that you might go to. Okay. Hey Raj, we yes. have a question. Great, thank you. Um, oftentimes companies develop a vision statement, it gets put in a drawer and forgotten. How often should you revisit, revisit your vision statement and your strategy? That's a great question. So uh, you don't want to revisit your strategy too often because you don't have enough time to actually go implement it. But I think having something like a corporate vision statement or a company success vision or something like that, I think that needs to be something that's right in front of you as you're executing your marketing program. One of the things we like to do with our clients is have our annual vision or our annual goal in front of us in every agenda that we review. So we have that goal right in front of us. And so we can very naturally ladder all of the activity we have to that vision. So if we're working on something that's off strategy or off vision, then we can very quickly determine that and maybe deprioritize it. I think strategy is important to relook at probably every two to three, maybe even longer years. And it shouldn't be a necessarily a um, brand new strategy every single time. If you're taking the time to revamp your strategy and make small updates to it, it's more of a fluid conversation. If there's big disruptions that are happening in your business, so for example, we're having a big disruption right now with the coronavirus, it's uh, obviously on everybody's minds as we speak. If that's making a very big impact on your business, that may be a time to really fundamentally look at your strategy. So I'd have two different answers. One is, I would look at your success vision on a very regular basis, and I would look to revamp your strategy as much as your business or your industry is changing, but at least every two to three years. Does that answer the question, Amanda? Yes, I think so. Great, with that, I'm happy to hand it over to uh, my colleague, Tracy Cola, to talk about fundamental number two. Tracy, you might be on mute if you're speaking. All right, thanks so much, Raj. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Awesome, all right. All right, so you have come up with your framework and now it's time for fundamental number two, which is uh, coordinating your approach. In today's world, a marketing department usually has at least 10 roles ranging from strategy to social media to PR and graphic design. Growing businesses often have people on the team who wear many hats and they're spread thin trying to accomplish a lot on any given day. 
The key to keeping everything coordinated and the trains running on time is having one person who oversees all marketing and sales activity. This has to be done using a calendar. You wanna make sure that you're planning out for at least three months at the minimum, but ideally six months is great. Pick a tactic you can focus on each month for the next six months. Make sure this letters back to the vision that you have for your company. Amanda, would you mind going to, perfect. If you look on slide eight, we have an example of a three to six month marketing calendar. We've got the date, the theme, um, what we're doing, so the tactic what the success metric is, how do we know if it was successful, who the owner is, and the link to where these items live. It's really important to have one traffic cop, one person who owns this calendar. While one person should own the calendar, all stakeholders should be able to easily access it. Um, are there any questions, Amanda? Yeah, we actually have two questions about this. Um, the first one is, how do you identify that person and what if you have lots of people both internally and externally? That is a great question. Um, it doesn't matter if it's an internal or external person. You need to pick the person whom you know will be hyper diligent, who will own this in full and will be laser focused, uh, making sure that everything gets done. It doesn't matter who it is, but they must have the bandwidth and the attention to detail to be able to manage it. Thank you. And um, our next question is about this graphic that we see on the page. Um, what if you only have the resources or bandwidth to do a handful of these 10 things that are listed here? What would you prioritize? So it, that's a really good question. It absolutely depends on the business. Um, you should pick the lowest hanging fruit. You should consider where you will get the most bang for your buck. Which tactics do you know you'll be able to execute successfully and see results from doing them? So it really does vary by business. Um, it just really depends on sort of drilling down to what your goals are and how you think you can get you can successfully hit those goals, which tactics will get you there. Right, I think it's also important to note that not all of these tac tactics are appropriate for every business too. So finding the right mix is what's gonna lead to success. 100%, absolutely. Thank you. All right, I think we're ready to go to fundamental number three, which is unleashing your uniqueness. What makes your company stand out from the rest? What makes you different? Why should someone pick your company, you, your service? Focus on what makes you stand out and pick marketing tactics that you can use to leverage your unique offering to your target audience. Your content should reflect what makes your offering unique. This includes everything from what's on your website to what you're saying on social media, whether it's Instagram or LinkedIn or whatever you're doing. Social media is a really great tool to grow your business because it lets you reach your audience in a very personal way. We recommend you use social media, and if you do, you want to make sure that you establish guidelines so your content and your visuals are cohesive and true to your brand's personality. Just like we preach that you should have one person own the calendar, we also recommend that you have someone assigned to answering emails and questions on social media so it's done consistently. The last thing you want to do is leave people hanging and not answer them or help them. And if you choose to use influencers, make sure they're a good fit with your brand and that they'll represent your brand in a way that's cohesive and true. Um, we have a question on social media. Yes. There are so many social media platforms um, with new ones launching all the time. Do you have to be active on all of them? You do not have to be active on all of them. It's most important to pick the platform that you think will resonate best with your audience and make sure that you're consistently posting content that speaks to your brand and is cohesive with your brand voice. So absolutely, you don't have to do all of them. Pick, a, pick one or two and do them really, really well. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, with that, I think I'm gonna hand it back to Raj. 
Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Tracy. So uh, the fourth uh, fundamental that you should really be thinking about goes back to metrics. And one of the things that we spend a lot of time with our clients talking about is the important of measure, importance of measuring success. So the first part of that is to be very intentional about what success looks like. But we encourage you guys to do that before you start. If you really think about the future of what a successful outcome looks like, uh, there's, a, there's a famous saying, begin with the end in mind. Begin with what that looks like. That will help you tremendously as opposed to seeing how things go, measuring things along the way, and then later deciding if that met your needs. If, you, if you're a little more disciplined about starting with the end in mind and developing your metrics, then it'll allow you to really and truthfully go back and determine if your uh, success was, if, if you achieve success. So as you're executing, you can keep adjusting your tactics and looking to determine what that success might look like. Um, one of the things we pride ourselves on is creating a standard monthly report for all of our marketing activity. So we encourage you guys to do the same for whatever part of the business that you're impacting. So what we have on the screen here is just a quick couple screenshots of what a sample report could look like. And so what we do, again, using this from uh, Google Analytics and Google Data Studio, which are free to anybody who has a website, is really taking a look at some key metrics. So if you go back to page number two, uh, just really quickly, one of the things we always look at is users, new users, pages per session. Those are digitally oriented metrics, but keeping a pulse on these high level metrics will help you determine what's working, what's not working. And then I'm sorry, let's, if you could just flip back through as you were, that, that was great, thank you. Uh, and if you, if you take a look at the other metrics that we're looking at, these are where audiences are coming from, how long they're staying on your site, what keywords they might be typing in, what geography they might be uh, coming from. These are all pieces of information that are readily available, and even for the most basic types of marketers. As you get more sophisticated, your metrics and your analytics should get more sophisticated as well. And so what we encourage is um, really make sure the metrics and the um, reports that you're looking at uh, meet the needs of your business. So I would most certainly say um, create a mechanism by which you can you can look at your metrics. Okay, so this is just an example of a sample report that we created. Um, I think that's about it. Uh, Amanda, any questions that are that are open before we open it up more broadly? Anything about this topic? Yeah, we um, the question is. A lot of companies measure a lot of things, but not the right things. Which success metrics are best? Yeah, unfortunately, the answer to that is it depends. And, and what I think it most depends on is that very first question I talked about 20 minutes ago. That was, um, what is your success vision? So are the things that you're measuring the right things to help you get to that original success vision? So for example, we have a client whose expressed goal is to get a certain number of new clients in 2020. So what we do is we create that as the success vision, and then all of the tools and tactics we have are focused on that one number. And so that becomes what we call a KPI. And for those who know the term, you know that it means a key performance indicator. That really helps reduce the noise of all the things that you could potentially measure to the really, really essential ones. I would say that a business needs probably between three and five key metrics. And if you're measuring a lot more than that, you might be measuring a lot of the noise and not the key most important pieces. So I would, I would challenge maybe the folks on the phone who are looking to get something out of this for their business. Do you know the three to five metrics that really drive your business and that will determine success? Because everything else you do should be against measuring and improving those metrics. Uh, thanks for that answer, Raj. Um, I want to thank both Raj and Tracy for their guidance today. I'm going to give people um, a few more minutes to get any remaining questions into the box to be answered. Um, in the meantime, I want to tell you a little bit more about and marketing. We provide a robust outsourced marketing department that growing companies need without the high overhead costs of big agencies or hiring full-time people to do 
all of those 10 things that Tracy pointed out. Um, so our model really empowers businesses to reach their growth goals um, through access to the guidance and expertise of senior level strategists like Raj and Tracy and a flexible execution team that we have um, at our disposal in our company. Our services fall under one of the four core service areas. So you can see on screen that we do uh, business marketing and strategy, business intelligence and analytics, storytelling and branding, and marketing planning and execution. Um, so with that, I'm gonna check the questions. We have, looks like we have one or two more questions. Um, the first one is for Raj. What kinds of research can you do to determine what your unique selling proposition is? What's your unique value? It's a great, uh, great question. So um, I would say from a research perspective, there's really two big buckets. Uh, what you really want to get into is the mind of the decision maker and how they make choices. So there's two ways to do that. That's quantitative data and that's qualitative data. And quantitative data tends to be better for businesses that have many more customers or those who are looking for really scientific uh, validation and data points. Qualitative tends to be a lot better for people who um, are looking for more in-depth and nuanced responses. They can both be extremely valuable and you can actually do both of them in combination really well. But what I would encourage you to put together a plan as you're putting together your research plan is to best understand what are the challenges that they're facing? What are all the different options that they could choose? Most people think about that as being direct competitors, but I encourage you not to be fooled by just looking at direct competitors. Quite often, the most uh, appropriate competitor is not a competitor at all, but it's something like do nothing. Right, many businesses were created with the with the current incumbent um, behavior of doing nothing or doing something very traditional, and they may not even know about the product or service that you have. So really understanding how that person makes a decision, and then mapping your solution to it. So again, if it's a food product in a particular category, are you thinking about that food product? as solving a particular challenge that somebody's having. Maybe it's a health condition, maybe it's a convenience play, maybe it's something like that. And on the business to business side, when you're doing research, are you really looking at all the different competitors that there could be, including do nothing, including a substitute? And have you found the reasons why your customers or your prospects may choose you versus the other ones? So that's a very quick sort of framework we like to use when considering doing research. Thank you. We have um, another question, and this one is for Tracy. You mentioned influencer marketing. Do you advocate paying influencers? That's a great question as well. Um, I think if you can pay for influencers, sure, go ahead. Um, but let's be real, quite often a budget for influencers just isn't there. Um, Thankfully, there are other things you can do. Um, maybe you offer them free services. Maybe you give them free product or, you know, company, maybe you give them sweatshirts or branded prop swag. Or um, another thing you could do is give them a discount code to share with their followers. Um, so there are, if you can pay for an influencer, sure, but it's not required. Tracy, if I could chime in with just one other one other little point there, uh, and and actually, if you have downloaded the workbook that we sent out, um, there's an article that we specifically wrote on influencer marketing. Uh, it's uh, it's linked on page number four, and it talks about six tips on influencer marketing for smaller businesses. Um, the one thing I would take out of that is the is the emergence and the importance of what we call micro influencers. So just as Tracy was saying, you can pay. I mean, Kim Kardashian is a great example. It would be wonderful if all of our businesses could afford to have Kim Kardashian do an in Instagram post about our business, but that's a million bucks or some exorbitant type of a fee. Uh, Micro-influencers come into play when you have a much smaller budget, but a much smaller universe. And this person may not have the following or the 
influence in, a, in, in the entire world. They may not even be known, but in a very small part of that world, they're extremely well known and very well trusted. So they may not, they may have a fraction of that number, but the people who they rely on really rely on them. In a business to business context, this is still completely relevant. Influencer marketing is not necessarily called influencer marketing in business to business marketing, but really working with partners, working with other organizations to help spread your value proposition and your offer is completely the same um, spirit with, as influencer marketing. So I might just add that point about micro influencers who could have a geographic or a very small niche that they're extremely well known. Using them can be a lot more fruitful for small and growing businesses. Absolutely. Thank you, Raj. Um, we have another question and I think it's probably best suited for Raj given your experience starting in marketing. Um, the question is, we are a small organization still growing our brand and aren't certain which tactics work best yet. What is recommended as we work through early stage marketing frustrations? Oh boy, um, that's a great question. I would I'd love to dig in and understand more about the business, uh, but at a general level that may be applicable to everybody, um, I think there is a, is a lot of magic in trying a lot of different things at an extremely low cost. There's a principle in software development called MVP. That's a minimally viable product, minimally viable product. And what the MVP concept teaches you is that instead of building the perfect product or the perfect thing and then taking it to the world, you should be looking for the fastest and the least expensive way to get real data, to get real data on your um, customers and how they behave. So what, what that means for a small business, I would say is, um, is uh, when you're when you're talking about trying different marketing tactics, is that you should try a whole bunch of different things and measure like crazy. So don't go into an don't go in an attitude with spending thousands of dollars on multiple tactics, but maybe you can do that at a much smaller scale. And what you're really looking for is any sort of data or evidence that this is where your audience hangs out. This is the messaging that they're resonating with or this is the type of promotion that they might want. So it's a very general question, but I think it applies to a lot of growing businesses with tight budgets. And I just encourage you to try a whole bunch of different things. One of the things that, and I'll just give my experience as an entrepreneur, one of the things we did at Ann Marketing is we would go out with multiple offers of similar nature and really experiment with what's working and what didn't work. And we were very quick to discontinue the things that weren't working and amp up the things that were working. And I would say in our early days, we've been doing this about three years, in our early days of probably the first six months or a year, it was a ton of that experimentation. Um, and there's no substitute for that. There's no uh, book where you can know exactly what your customers want. And I'll just give you one more example because I think it's an awesome one. Uh, a friend of mine grew, grew her business um, by literally walking down the street with cookies and snacks for business owners to learn about how they make decisions. So she could gather data in an extremely quick way so she understands how those people make decisions. If you take that to a marketing promotional context and say, my goal is to learn as much as I can, as fast as I can, you'll probably learn a ton in that process. Thanks, Raj. Um, all right, we're gonna wrap up. If we didn't get to your question, uh, or if we didn't answer it completely for you, please feel free to follow up with, you, with us. Um, I wanna talk about what to expect next. Um, you are going to receive an email with a couple of items. First is a recording of today. So please feel free to review it, refer back to it, and please don't hesitate to share it with your colleagues or nef networks for reference. Um, and also, we're offering everybody on today's webinar a free, no commitment marketing consultation. It could be on anything related to strategy, planning, execution, storytelling, branding, analytics, and reporting. Um, so please feel free to reach out to us for that opportunity. We will also email it to you, or you can contact us via the, um, our website, andmarketing.com backslash contact. Um, 
We're going to put that link in the chat box as well, so you'll have it in front of you right now. Um, we also would really appreciate it if you uh, take a minute to uh, respond to the evaluation that is immediately following the conclusion of the webinar. Your feedback will really help us provide offerings for the future. Um, and before we go, we have our next webinar coming up. It's called How to Wake the Dead. And it's using marketing automation to re-engage lost prospects or previous customers. That's going to be on Thursday, April 23rd. So you can register um, at the link that's going to go in the chat box as well. Um, and that will be in your email follow-up too. Uh, as always, please feel free to contact us if you ever need anything. Um, thank you for your time today. We look forward to connecting with you again soon. And with that, we, this concludes our webinar for today. Thank you so much, everyone.